Um, so, uh, welcome to font. Let's see, what is it? Fonts, form, and function: a primer on digital typography. Do we have any like type enthusiasts in the room? Okay, that's great. And then, how about uh, who's here to learn about type, like starting from scratch? Okay, that's great too. That's even better for me actually because it's a primer. So it's uh, we're starting, starting in the beginning. Um, let me introduce myself. My name is uh, Robbie Ingerbretson. I work for a, a design agency. I actually started a design agency called Pixel Lab. We're based out of Seattle, Washington. Are there any other Americans here? Just me? Okay, well. Is it a novelty to hear an American accent? Not really, right? If you guys come to the U.S., you will, you, you're heroes. We love any other accent, and we, sound, we know that we sound kind of stupid everywhere we go, but that's okay. Um, okay, well, I want to start off. By the way, we, this is a little bit lightly attended, but I promise this will be a great talk. So stick around. We'll have a ton of fun, and it's kind of nice that it's small. You can interrupt me, ask questions. We'll kind of treat it more like a classroom, all right? Um, so I'm going to start off by reminding you, telling you about, uh, about a story of a scandal, rumor, disgrace, Betrayal, a story that shocked the type world. Um, you may remember Verdana Gate. Anybody remember this? So in, I think it was 2009, um, IKEA did the unthinkable. And they swapped Futura, the typeface that they'd been using for years and years and years, for Verdana. Not just in, the, in their, uh, you know, their web and, and digital materials, but everywhere, they changed their catalogs from this typeface that they'd been using for, I don't know, since the inception of IKEA until uh, 2009. And people were so upset about this that it made headlines in the New York Times, Time Magazine. This is, I think, as close as uh, typography has ever gotten to like real news, by the way. So this is a big moment. Um, this is the difference. I don't know if, I mean, some people don't see it. Some people do see it. I don't know if you see it, that, but this, this side right here is the, uh, the old one. This is Futura. On the right-hand side, we have the switch, a move to Verdana. And the reason that this was so upsetting to people, <laughs> this something terrible that had happened, the reason it was so upsetting to people is that they made a change for what seemed at the time to be the wrong reason. So they moved, um, I, and I have to say it was well-intentioned, but they moved from a typeface that was targeted at print to a typeface that was targeted at the web, to, from a sort of a print typeface to a digital typeface. And you can understand why they did it, because maybe they saw that, uh, although, you know, it's funny, I, I still don't think of Ikea as a particularly, I don't know, like digital organization. I don't know if people shop Ikea online. I don't think so. Um, but, uh, you know, maybe it, was, it seemed kind of forward looking. Here you can kind of see the difference side by side. The thing about Verdana is it was designed to be a great screen typeface and not a great print typeface. And if you look at it large, you know, like, it, like in the, the headline there, it kind of looks awkward. It, the spacing seems a little bit too wide. The, um, the characters themselves seem to kind of have an odd rhythm to them. Uh, compared to something like Futura, which is really beautiful. It's super geometric. It's been around forever. It's, it's actually the basis of a bunch of typefaces that we love, like Avenir, which is... Um, a, it shows up on your iPhone really frequently. Um, Gotham, which is, was the, it, actually it's the typeface that, that these slides are using, and it was the Obama typeface in 2008. It's also the HBO typeface. Um, so it's a classic, and they traded it for something that kind of felt new. The reason um, that I noticed this, and I thought that it was so interesting, was, uh, do, so this was, I think, it was 2009, and at the time, um, I was still using uh, an RSS reader. Do you guys remember? the days, and, um, to get my news. And these two headlines showed up uh, in the same session for me. In fact, if you look at the dates, they're right next to each other. So one was August 26th, and the other was September 4th. So within, you know, roughly a week for each other, I saw these two headlines. And I, I couldn't help but notice the irony. Because uh, Verdana, or sorry, Ikea was switching to a digital typeface for the stated reason that they couldn't find a type that they couldn't use something like Futura on a, on a screen. And at the same time, Paul Irish, who you guys may know, he's a guy that works for Google, um, he was publishing sort of his best syntax for font face, which gives you the ability to use custom fonts inside of a browser. So at the same moment that, Verd that Ikea was abandoning Futura for Verdana, Paul Irish was sort of, you could say, announcing the, the future of uh, custom typefaces on the web. 
Um, I like this story because I think it shows this sort of contrast between the, this like, incredibly rich history that we have with uh, type and its print basis and sort of what's going on right now, where type's definitely like undergoing this sort of explosion of interest. It's becoming very important. It's driven a whole bunch of design in the last five or six years. Flat design, you could argue, was sort of type-driven. Um, and uh, this was sort of a moment for me, right? This is where these two things came together. So let me tell you about this talk. So a couple things. First of all, this talk is for anybody that loves or wants to love type. You don't need to be a typographer. I think, I, in fact, in practicing for this talk, um, I have given it to my wife and also to my 12-year-old son. So people who have uh, no interest really in type other than uh, just supporting me. Um, the other thing is a primer. Do you guys know what that word means? That is not a common American word, by the way. That's a very European word. We don't say it very much. Do you guys say it a lot? It sounds kind of English to me. Do you really? That's so... How about that? So it's a primer. For us, a primer is uh, something that you paint with. How about that? Yeah, we say primer. That seems opposite. I would have expected you guys to say primer and we say primer. Huh. Um... So it's a primer. And uh, finally, um, this talk's a little inside out compared to most talks that you might get on typography in that um, I'm going to kind of skip the stuff you normally talk about. So this is, you know, normally if you, if you got a typography talk, this is where you might start, sort of the anatomy of type. To be honest with you, I don't think that this is really learning. This is just naming things. Um, the, uh, do you guys know Richard Feynman? Surely you're joking, Mr. Feynman. That's his thing. He said that naming things is not learning. I agree with that. If you can name these things, it doesn't do you anything. What we're trying to do is help you understand how to use type and what it is. So we'll be a little bit inside out. We're going to sort of start with the, the soul and the heart of type and then work our way out. Um, although I will point out that that thing's called a gadzook. How about that? Um, okay, so let's start with this question. What is typography? Um, so we're going to kind of approach this, um, and this will actually sort of be the the basis for the talk. So we're going to first talk about the shape of words and letters, right? That's one thing that is typography. Another thing is the layout on the page, so how you, you know, compose type, how you put typefaces, forms together. And then finally, we'll talk a little bit about the technology that we use today for rendering and getting things on the screen. Um, so kind of start with the shape of letters. So... Um, the fundamental unit of type is a glyph, right? And a glyph is one character. And it's, uh, you know, anciently a glyph was sort of a unit of meaning. I actually, how about this? I just saw the Rosetta Stone yesterday. How about that? And I learned something. I learned that uh, with the Rosetta Stone, we discovered that something like this, this glyph, which would presumably be an Egyptian hieroglyph, works a lot more like a character in an English alphabet or a Roman alphabet. It has a sound, not a word meaning. That was new. They didn't know that. People didn't know that until uh, that guy found the, uh, or interpreted the Rosetta Stone. Um, so today, though, we have a really, really sophisticated way of thinking about how to represent information visually, right? We have sophisticated alphabets, so much so that we go even beyond kind of just the idea of trying to portray a letter, but try to put meaning into the sort of the form of how we represent that letter or those words. Um, when you combine uh, a bunch of glyphs into words or into a set of glyphs, um, you have a, now what do you think it is, a typeface or a font? So either answer is right. So here's the good news. Typeface or font is kind of a confusing term. When to use which is hard to know. The good news is that you're probably right whichever one you use in most circumstances. But that is not enough for us today. We're going to uh, go a little bit deeper. So best way to kind of understand, I think, this difference is to think of the example of Garamond. So have you guys ever used the font Garamond before? Have you seen it on your computer? Um, so Garamond's a great example because Garamond was designed in, I think, the 1500s. I bet it's in my notes. Uh, the typographer who designed it was a guy named, he was a punch cutter named Claude Garamond. He lived between 1480 and 1560, right? So it's super, super old. This design is as old as, uh, you know, well, I was going to say anything around here, but that's probably not true because we're here. Um, but it's very, very, very old. Um, and when it was designed, he designed a typeface. He, the thing that he created was a typeface. He designed a typeface. Then he took that typeface, which he had designed, and he turned it into a font. 
So he cut the letters, he, he was a punch cutter, so he cut the letters, turned them into a font, then he had a bucket of letters. Those buck, that bucket of letters, that combination was a font. It sat in a desk drawer for somebody somewhere and they, they uh, um, produced uh, words with it. So here's one way to kind of think about it. So a font is to a typeface as a recording is to a song. So kind of the, uh, the fundam- like the ideal, sort of the, um, the ephemeral ideal of a font is its typeface. That's the thing that it represents. A font is like a, an incarnation of that, just like a recording is an incarnation of a song. So here I even have a picture for you. So a font is to a typeface as a recording is to a song. So in a digital world, what that means is that there are something like um, 12 different uh, versions of Garamond that you could go buy right now. Adobe makes two, I believe. Microsoft has one, Apple has one. Multiple foundries create Garamonds, and they're all based on this original typeface. The thing you're buying, though, is a font, right? It's an incarnation of that typeface. There are something like 200,000 fonts in the world, or let's say typefaces in the world. Um, and that is a totally made up number. I have no idea how many there are. But the point is that there are many. And um, so when it comes to working with them, um, you have this big challenge, which is you need to, to choose the right one. So as a typographer, the thing you want to do is find a type that works. And I mean that in two ways. One is kind of works like it works like, hey, that works. It looks great. Also mean it works like it's doing a job for you, right? So to understand how to get type to do the job that you want it to do, we've started to think of type as performing different jobs. So there's lots of ways you can break this down. We're going to talk about two. I've, I've included some of them here. So there's body type. Um, body type is the stuff you read. So if you're, if you're working with body type, you want it to be easy to read. There's display type. Display type is like headlines or signage. Um, it's usually designed to be big, and so it has different characteristics than, say, reading a paragraph of text. Uh, decorative type. Decorative type is, is uh, trying to convey personality. It's trying to convey something through something bigger than the words that it means. Some, it's trying to illustrate something. Um, interface type is, I would say, kind of a subcategory of body type. So um, we'll talk about this in a minute, but when you create body type for print versus body type for uh, digital stuff, there are differences in how you think about them. And we'll talk about that right now, actually. Okay, so we talked about body text. It's the text you read. It's good for sentences and paragraphs. Um, I like this quote. Um, this is a really, really old... This guy was a print designer, and it's an old uh, typography manual, and he says, typography has one plain duty before it, and that is to convey information in writing. No arguments or considerations can absolve typography from this duty. So fundamentally, the thing that you're trying to do is convey information. Um, or at least <laughs> that is normally the case. This is uh, the work of a guy named David Carson, and he was a graphic artist in the 1980s, and he had this uh, magazine called Ray Gun. And he started doing this crazy thing. This is an article from the magazine. He would do crazy things with, uh, uh, with type layout and type design, almost like E.E. E. Cummings, um, but for type rather than for words. And um, he pushed the envelope. Generally, however, this is not what our goal is. So unless you're David Carson, I think you can stick with a uh, simpler goal, which is legibility. So um, one thing that's kind of worth understanding is the difference between legibility and readability. So legibility has to do with the power of the individual glyphs to be um, recognized. Readability has more to do with the comfort of interacting with that text over an extended amount of time. Um, and generally, you want both, but that's not always the case. So, for instance, a phone book needs to be legible, but it doesn't need to be readable because uh, most of us don't read phone books. Um, although I'm sure there are people that do, and those people are probably mad that it's not more readable, but it is very legible. And so you, you can see that in the phone book, they're trading information density for readability. And that's fair, you know, things to trade. Um, see, uh, there's a myth about um, readability and, and legibility, which is that for some reason, serif fonts, so fonts that have, do you guys know what a serif font is? It's a font that has uh, extenders on the bottom. Um, so like Times Roman or Georgia are serif fonts, versus a sans serif font, which is something like, that, like Arial or Helvetica. Um, there's a myth that 
uh, serif, font is, serif fonts are easier to read, and, but it's not the case. Um, I thought I had a better slide that displayed this. I think we'll get to that in just a minute. Okay, so um, five steps toward uh, choosing a great body font. So the first thing that you can do to choose a great body font, meaning one that's both readable and legible, is choose something with a large X height. So the X height refers to, as you can see, the height of a lowercase letter X. And that tends to set the general height of all of the lowercase characters. And the reason that this is imp important, you can see here. Um, does anybody know what that says? See if you can guess. You can take a minute. I mean, people have guessed this and gotten it right. What is it? I am so impressed. You were the second person to ever get it. And I've given this talk like four or five times. That's, that's impressive, man. So you're right. That's right. It says weatherman. Um, but... Very, very hard to know. I'm super impressed. In fact, when I was going through the slides today, I couldn't remember what I said. And I, <laughs> I said several minutes trying to remember. Um, it says weatherman. Um, how about this one? Sunshine, right? There's a tremendous amount of information that's conveyed in that top half of the X height. So if you can increase the size of that, it draws attention to it and makes it more, which would it be legible or readable? Legible, right? Because you can recognize the, the individual glyphs. Um... Another thing uh, that you can do if you want to create or if you want to find a great body typeface or font is you want to choose less stroke contrast. And so um, you can see that uh, in this example, we've, we've got Dido, or as I say it, I don't know, there's probably so many French in here that can correct that for me. Um, but you've got Dido and Gil Sands. Um, Dido is known for having like a very like, strong contrast between the. Um, between the stroke, the, the, I don't know, the, I guess the vertical and the horizontal strokes. So right there. Um, and uh, that also uh, decreases readability, especially on screens, because those strokes tend to be hard to, um, t uh, tend to be hard to render. Okay, next thing is you want to choose something with strong glyph support. And um, this is, more and more is actually becoming less of a problem. Great, good typefaces. We also have software now that helps typographers build these um, characters more easily. It used to be this was pretty hard to find in sort of anything outside of like a, sort of a mainstream typeface. Nowadays, this is a lot easier. Um, another thing to look for is you want to avoid weird stuff. This, as you can imagine, <laughs> decreases uh, both readability and legibility. Um, uh, this is kind of interesting. Um, typically, the way that we read is we look for shapes. And so in this example, these were all... Uh, this, this was a test that was done where people were shown words where they're supposed to try to identify or recognize words that were misspelled. And they were way more likely to recognize that T-E-S-C was wrong than T-E-S-F. And the reason is that the shape for test and test is very similar. So you're likely to skip over that. We read by looking at the overall shape of a word, not by looking at the shape of the individual characters. And so the weird stuff gets in the way of that, obviously. Um, and... Uh, Here's the best advice of all, is for, um, for reading, for legibility and readability, use something that's tried and true. If you look at major newspapers and major magazines, generally they will take one of two strategies uh, for the, the typefaces they choose for body text. Either they'll use something that's been around as a digital typeface for a long time, like Georgia's very, very common, uh, Times New Roman, Helvetica, or they'll use something they've been using in print for a very, very long time, and they'll create a digital version of that, which is um, like what the New York Times does, for instance. And the reason is that there's really not a lot that can replace the, the refinement that comes after somebody reads and reads and reads. And so that actually is... Um, oh, this is the myth of the serifs. This is where I had that extra uh, thing in there. Um, so if, if you look at this... Um, You'll notice how the serifs get muddy compared to the... So the, the extra serifs that you have are actually just creating noise, digital noise. And so for that reason, it makes the typeface a lot more muddy. So generally, people would say that serifs are, if, might be distracting. At, at, uh, at best, they're doing nothing in terms of uh, creating readability. And that's what the studies show. You know, that's a great question. I don't know. The study that I saw about that, it was a, it was a researcher, and I, I can track it down for you. I don't actually remember who did it, but the researcher... The reason for the, 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 the Yeah. 
Yeah, did you guys hear that? So the, the, the reason for the seraphs was that in, um, in, in, when you were carving in stone, it, you would allow, it'd allow you to have a clean termination to a long line. Um, I'm not sure what the research says about for print. I had heard my entire life, actually, that seraphs like, allow, you, allow you to establish like a, a, a line along the bottom of the text, and it improved readability, not necessarily legibility. This study that I found, and if you e- email me, I'm happy to track it down for you, um, indicated that that was not the case, that uh, it didn't help, and it, it was referring specifically to digital type. I'm not sure about print. I would imagine, to be honest, that because, you know, if you think about this, all the research that I've seen shows that this is how we read, and I would imagine that the serifs are more of a distraction than a help there, that they're not adding to our ability to recognize shapes, but I'm not sure about that. When I say go with classics, I mean Helvetica only. Oh. Was that not clear? <laughs> There's some subtlety to this, guys. You have to work through it. Um, the subtlety is Helvetica only. Okay, so um, this is the best of all the advice back on track here, is that you need to read it, and that's why you go with the classics. So, you know, to be honest, Georgia is probably my favorite body typeface, and it is a serif face, so there you go. Um, okay. Moving on, we'll talk about display uh, typefaces. So display text is designed for headlines, signage, things that are big. And it's actually a lot more fun. And this is where you can actually play with uh, uh, text a little bit more. Rather than trying to choose something that favors uh, legibility and in particular readability, you really don't need to think about readability. Legibility is still important. Um, so uh, when we talk about display, by the way, this confused me forever. I thought that display text meant text that was designed to be shown on a display. That's not true. It's older than this kind of a display. It's used for displays, like I think, like signage. I think is where that comes from. Um, okay. So I love this quote, and I think this is a great way to think about uh, choosing a display typeface. So typographical design should perform optically what the speaker creates through voice and gesture of his thoughts. Especially for display, I think this is a great way to think about it. So let me show you an example of that. So um, this conveys something, right? See this? It says, very soon, we're all going to the zoo. This looks, I think, sort of the feeling this conveys, to me at least, as a children's book, or it's sort of a fun feeling. It's very different than this, right? <laughs> Which <laughs> is not, it's a different kind of zoo altogether, I think. Um, so this is a, it's a really similar quote. Um, faces of type are like men's faces. You know, by the way, I, whenever I read these quotes, these are, these are like these guys in like the 60s and 70s. I imagine mad men, like these guys that are trying to like pronounce these like pearls of wisdom about the, you know, this crazy industry they have. But anyway, faces of type are like men's faces. They have their own expression, their complexion, and peculiar twists and turns of line identify them immediately to friends to whom each is full of identity. So with that in mind, one way that you can think about um, working with type is you can think of it as like a casting call, right? Imagine that the typefaces are actors, and you're setting the stage, you're trying to tell a story, and you can think like, okay, who do I want to be my display type face? Who's sort of my supporting characters, the body? Who's the, the lead, the, the major headline? So with that in mind, I have sort of a fun game for us to get into this. So I'm going to show you a typeface. And you tell me, we're going to do the opposite of what I just said. You tell me what actor you would cast in the role. So who is Helvetica? I'll kick this off for you. Um, Helvetica is Kevin Bacon, right? Because he shows up everywhere. He's a hard worker, um, can play any role, uh, kind of plain, and also kind of connected to everything, and everybody just sort of loves it, right? Okay, let's do another one. Um, by the way, this is Ariel. It's Kevin Bacon's sort of less attractive... Uh, um, <laughs> Younger, what's that word? Doppelganger. There we go. Okay, how about Clarendon? Any ideas who this might be? I'll tell you, uh, I think of Clarendon as a little loud, super friendly, great for delivering good news, lots of positive energy, um, a slightly masculine version of something feminine. Does anybody come to mind? That's pretty good, actually. It's not bad. That's not who I had, but I, I, I think I'll give it to you. Who's that? Robin Williams, that's pretty great too. I would take either of those. I chose Ellen, actually. Um, So I have a challenge for you. This is the one that you can take home and think about. So I'm going to give you an actor. You need to think of the corresponding typeface. And uh, um, let me know if you think of a good one. So who would Chuck Norris be? How about that? 
I can tell you who Chuck Norris isn't, and that's Comic Sans. Um, what's that? Yeah, Impact. That's a great one. That is it. Do you guys know Impact? Super Bowl. That is a great one. That's a, that's a fantastic choice. Okay. Um, this, I, this is a Chuck Norris joke about type that I found the other day, by the way. Do you guys know what it means to hint something? So type hint. Anyway. Um, he looks uh, like he could do exactly that. Okay. So um, here is sort of just some general thinking about how to choose a, a display face. So um, you can choose serifs. Serifs tend to make things feel a little bit uh, more buttoned up. Uh, stroke contest tends to make things feel, I was looking for a word here, I just think fancy, right? It just feels a little bit more formal, but I already had said that for serifs, so I guess uh, we'll go with fancy. Um, slab serif, so slab serif is, is like a regular serif font, except that the um, the extenders all have the same thickness all the way around. And the, the serifs, sorry, the serifs and the, have the same thickness as the extenders. Um, ge ge geometric fonts are fonts also like a slab serif where it tends to have a very uniform sort of look to the um, strokes. They tend to feel modern and progressive. They grew out of like the Bauhaus movement, so they're very systematic. They feel kind of um, uh, industrial. Um, narrow typefaces tend to be a little bit harder to read, so you tend to sacrifice a little bit of uh, both legibility and readability, but it does feel more down to business, and for a display face, that's usually fine. It's kind of a way of saying that um, whatever you have to say is sort of more staccato, important, has to be, you have to get it out there quickly. So you tend to see this for headlines a lot. On the other hand, if you extend that out and um, have more of an extended font, it seems to sort of indicate that you're it's more pensive, more thoughtful, um, and also tends to be, seem a little bit more important. Um, so once you begin to sort of play with these different personalities um, for your display faces, then you have the exciting job of pairing. So often you have to choose uh, a different typefaces and hope that they work together. And this is a lot like choosing colors. To be honest, it's, it, there's, it's really hard to find much science to it, and a lot of things work. But that thing, that combination that you create tends to say something. Um, this was an example that there's a, there's Hofler Fair Jones, or I think it's just Hofler and Co. Now is a foundry that created a ton of really famous typefaces. And this is um, an example that they put together using a lot of their typefaces. The thing that I found remarkable here is just the like sheer number of typefaces that they got to work in one design. Generally, that's not something you do. Generally, you try to limit yourself to one typeface, maybe two. If you're a rebel, three, but four would be, I guess, you're, you'd get fired if you worked for me. Um, so here's some sort of simple ways to approach pairing. So here's the basics. So first of all, fewer font families. Those guys were very, very good. They can pair multiple typefaces together. Most of us cannot. So think fewer typefaces. Uh, you can be bold without many, many typefaces. In fact, a lot of times, many, many typefaces create clutter and make you less bold. Um, this, I think, is really good advice. First of all, look for contrast, and then seek for harmony. So uh, figure out what your, maybe your headline is trying to say and how that's different than your body. So if you want to create interest, look for contrast, but then you need to create unity and harmony later on. And then this is also good advice, um, which is at most you can have one hero. You can't have multiple heroes, or you end up with Suicide Squad or something like that. You end up with a big mess. Um, so one or fewer heroes. Yeah, that's a great, that is a really great question. So, um, actually, you know what? This will make it a little bit more clear right here. So, a family um, is the same thing as a, so, uh, yeah, this is where maybe we should have done some anatomy of type first. So, a, a font family would be something like uh, Gotham or Garamond or Ariel or Helvetic is a great example. So, Helvetica comes in multiple forms though. So, you have like Helvetica Light, Helvetica Condensed, Helvetica Bold, Helvetica Ultra Bold, all of those things fall under the, the family of Helvetica. And so um, if you choose a single family, the advantage that you have is that you know that those, they already have a tremendous amount of harmony. And a lot of times you can find contrasts within the family, but you know that they're already harmonized. Does that make sense? So here's an example. This is um, a type, oh, this is Helvetica, perfect. So you can see up at the top we have Helvetica Condensed Bold, and then for sort of the, I guess the, the byline, we have 
Helvetica regular bold, and then we have Helvetica regular, and I guess in this case we're using a light version of it for the body, right? So we still have contrast, but we know they're harmonized because they all belong to the same family. Does that clear up the question of what a family is? Okay. So um, a lot of the families that we're used to will have maybe two or three different sort of variations, like uh, you might have normal and bold or regular and bold, or if you're lucky, an italic in there. Um, and it's hard, this is harder to do with that. So if you're going to play this game, you often want to look for a, um, a family that has multiple variations. And they're out there. You know, if you, if, I don't know where you guys get fonts, but like if you go to Google Fonts, you can actually look for, you can sort of sort by fonts that have multiple variations, or families that have multiple uh, variations. Okay, so here's a, this is a really beautiful example of a... Um, uh, just working within one family. And actually here there, I, I mean, I think this is really just an italic and a regular. And just by varying the size, they're able to create an incredible amount of contrast. I, I've actually found this quite beautiful and, I, and inspiring when I, when I first saw it. Um, okay, so another option that you have is to pair a serif with a sans. And this is kind of a, the classic, right? Um, because you know here, now you're favoring contrast first, and then you'll find harmony later. Um, so, you, because you have a serif and a sans, you know that you've already found contrast, now you need to look for harmony, and you can do that often by, um, in a way, I mean, it's, it's a little bit of art here, you can just kind of look at personality and sort of try to get a feel for it. But the other thing you can look for is um, for similarities in, um, like the way that they would render unique characters, like A's and G's, there's multiple variations. So you could look for, they call them like single story A's or double story A's. It's either like the, uh, so these are, these are double story A's, a single story is like how you did it when you were a kid. Um, so you could look for that. You can look for similar stroke contrast. You can look for those kinds of things to then create harmony. To be honest, if you're only working with two different families, you don't need to worry as much about harmony. So um, it's more when you're, it, you introduce a third. It's kind of like color that way. Um, this is a great example. Comedy Central did this thing where, with their rebranding where they um, had, uh, they, they mo moved to a, a sans for sort of their main logo type, and then they paired that with a serif font for all of their kind of additional um, uh, display text, and I, I actually just thought it worked really, really well. Okay, um, the other thing that you can do is you can Pick something with a lot of personality for your display and then pair that with something that is known to be very neutral. And then you're kind of moving all of the personality up into the display uh, typeface, like your headlines or your bylines. And then you um, sort of focus on something a little bit more readable and legible for the body. This is what a lot of magazines do. Like Fast Company does this. I think Wired does this. I think both of them use Georgia for their body. And then they have, in fact, uh, Fast Company I don't think they use Lee Gothic, but they use a typeface very similar to that for their headlines. You may have noticed. Um, here's another example of that where this, uh, the, the menu on the side is clearly something very simple. It looks like Helvetica or even Arial. And then the headline is a really, really bold, kind of interesting uh, typeface with a lot of uh, stroke contrast. Um, so Matthew Carter is a typographer that... Uh, he actually is the guy that designed Verdana. He did a bunch of other typefaces for Microsoft. Super sort of well-known living typographer. And this is a hard quote to read, but I like it so much that I included it anyway. Um, so I'm going to re read it and try to give emphasis to the thing that you need to take from it. So it says, as the saying goes, this is so funny because if this really were a saying, nobody would remember it because it's so hard to, to parse. Type is a beautiful group of letters, not a group of beautiful letters. Does that make sense? So what that's saying is that ultimately, when you are putting type together, you want to think about the harmony of the group rather than the individual characters. And so again, that good advice of you've got to read it, you need to look at it, and you need to see it as a whole. It's a little, you know, this is what's fun, I think, about typography is there's not, it's as much art as it is science, and so it's a place where you can play. And it's okay to, if you want to start playing with typography, it's okay to play, look at things, walk away, and kind of embrace the, uh, the art of it. All right. Do you guys feel like you understand the shape of letters? Because it's time to move on. So we're going to talk about layout. Um, so uh, when, it, when we think about layout, so layout is, the, is how we position the letters on the screen, right? Where do we put the sentences? How do things sort of come together? 
to create a, a you know, sort of a gestalt or, or a, the meaning as a whole. Um, and I thought this was a really simple way to kind of state the goal of that. Um, she says, typography helps readers navigate the flow of the content. So when you're thinking about layout, maybe that's the thing that you're trying to do is establish the meaning of the document or the thing you're creating as a whole rather than, you know, sort of the, the units. You're, this is your chance to kind of create a gestalt, help give people a way to move through things and also experience something as a whole when they first get there. So um, to that end, uh, this is some copy that we had on our website years ago. It's actually not there anymore. Um, but I thought this was kind of an interesting exercise. Um, I thought we could take some copy from a website, a real website, um, and kind of go through the process of a layout and apply some of the things that we learned to this particular uh, copy. When you show up to this, you really honestly would, I mean, you could read it and then you might understand it, but even after you read it, I think you would kind of have a hard time knowing what I think is important, right? Like you might figure out what you think is important, but I didn't tell you anything. Um, so when it comes, you know, going back to that quote, the thing that we're trying to do is help somebody navigate this, help somebody understand what I think is important. I want to convey to them how they should experience this thing as a whole. Um, do you guys know who Jakob Nielsen is? He's a usability guy, human factors guy that's been around forever. He's like, I think of him as like the web's like, like number one curmudgeon. He, um, he's awesome. Uh, spends a lot of time telling us the mistakes that we're making. Um, so this, this is an old quote. I think this is from like 1997 when the web was brand new. Even when the web was brand new, he noticed this thing, which is the way that we read on the web. He said, this is how, readers, how users read on the web. They don't. We don't read. Instead, they scan the page, picking out individual words and sentences. So the first thing that you want to do when you're looking at type and thinking about layout is you need to create hierarchy. And um, hierarchy gets created when we can define contrast. And again, it's kind of what we were talking about earlier with uh, pairing, where you're trying to balance. You're trying to do this thing where you need to create contrast and then bring unity to that contrast, right? So um, these are not the only ways that you can create hierarchy or create contrast, but some of the most common are you can uh, create hierarchy with spacing, uh, symbols, color, and size. So we can apply some of that. Um, the first one that we'll start with is just some spacing. So if I literally just add some carriage returns between this, you begin to kind of see how at least I group these things, right? So you can see, for instance, that quote stands on its own. Um, case studies just became a headline. And um, Agent 8-Ball now looks like a headline of its own, right? Um, we kind of already covered that, so I'll just keep going. So now I'm, we can apply some sizing differences. So here we're creating some even greater contrast. So we already had structure. Now we're adding even greater contrast to that structure. Um, with, we've done a couple of things. So one is we've varied the sizing, and we've also varied the weights. So bold, as I think everybody just intuitively knows, it typically is used to indicate that something is louder or more important. It doesn't always have to be the case. Um, although if things are the same size and one of them is bolded and one isn't, it almost always would be interpreted that the bold one is the louder or the more important of the two. Um, so just by giving, making a couple of things bold, like age and eight ball, we now know as a headline, even though it's the same size as that paragraph below, um, and then pixel lab and case studies are clearly the sort of two anchors that you have in this text now. Um, I, w <laughs> I think this is so intuitive, but I think it's funny to look at. You can, not, you can try to create contrast and fail. So for instance, um, if you have two typefaces that look a lot like each other, you're not creating contrast. Or if you are not varying the size enough, you're not creating contrast. Or <laughs> If you, this is extra funny here because on my screen they actually look like different colors. Here they look like they're identical colors. Um, and that's actually a real problem that a lot of times we work on better screens than the people who are actually interacting with the things that, uh, that we do. So, so my advice here is if you want to create contrast, don't be afraid to, to mean it, right? Be bold. Um, so we hire a lot of designers, and one of the things I've noticed about new designers is that, um, and this is true when people are learning how to design, is is that you make like these micro tweaks and, because it doesn't quite feel right. And I'll just, this is advice. If you find yourself trying to design something 
and you're spending a lot of time on micro tweaks, you need to step back and, and think about the larger tweaks because micro tweaks are probably not going to convey the thing that you're trying to convey. So, you know, micro tweaks like they'll move spacing three pixels or they'll adjust the color by two shades or whatever. That sort of thing is probably not working in your favor. Usually, if that's where you're spending your time, you need to step back. So, and you're probably living over here instead of living over there. Um, I, this is a great example of uh, multiple levels of contrast. Um, there is no question about what the headline is here. It is clearly with daily, right? No, I'm joking, of course. It is um, clearly last minute travel apps. And anyway, it's just clear what's going on here. So this is a great example of uh, creating contrast. So if you combine those two things, you want to create contrast and um, you want to create, use the contrast to create hierarchy. Now we get to come to this great rule of thumb, which is we all work in threes. And I don't know why this is. I'm sure there's research. But uh, if you think about the hierarchy that you're trying to create in three parts, or if it's a longer document or something, you can you know, maybe have four or five. But typically, we think in threes. So this is just a powerful place to start, is try to create three levels of hierarchy. So if we apply that here, actually, you can see we kind of already did. We sort of have these three levels of hierarchy. We have the, the pixel lab and case studies, which is, are sort of the top level headlines. We have Agent 8 Ball, which is another sort of level of structure, although I think you could argue that we don't have enough contrast there with the, the body text yet. Um, oh, and then we've added uh, some, a little bit of contrast to, uh, you know, it's funny, we really have four here, and I, did, I put it right after the three levels. I've never noticed that. It's kind of a mistake, but that's okay. Um, okay. So uh, here we're creating a, a much sort of stronger sense of the, the three things that I want you to notice. So there's clearly this, this important thing up at the top, kind of a, a middle section, and then sort of the, the third thing uh, down at the bottom. Um, <clears throat> so um, when I did this, I sort of felt like the headline, the thing that I wanted you to notice most, was getting lost up at the top. And so we made this flip where we put it more in the middle, so it was sort of more eye-grabbing. Um, and uh, I guess that the reason that... You know, I'd love to give you a rule for why we make that change. I think that there isn't a great one. Um, I think instead, the thing that you need to think about is how are you devoting space to different things? And this is a great quote from Alex White. If you're an aspiring designer, by the way, this book by Alex White called The Elements of Design. Are there are, are any of you guys developers that are trying to understand a little bit more about design? This is a fantastic book for you. Um, that's kind of how I am, too. I started off in computer science and sort of through my career have moved... Uh, toward design. And this guy, Alex White, wrote this book called The Elements of Design. And it is a, it, it is a fantastic book. And it's, it is, it's like it's written for the um, sort of analytical mind of a developer. He takes these principles that are normally, I think, talked about, um, I, I don't know, without a, a, a ton of structure. And he gives a lot of structure to them. It's a fantastic book. And it's like, it's maybe like 100 pages. It's a suit, you can read it in, in two sittings. You can read it in one. Um, so anyway, he's got this great quote where he says, typography is 10% letter management and 90% space management. And that's what I think is going on here, is that as you go from here to here, you realize that um, you, are, you, you have to kind of understand not just where the letters go, but what goes in between them. And again, it kind of comes back to this idea of gestalt. Like, how do you help people perceive something as a whole? Um, when it comes to this question of space management, there is this really, really old principle that we can rely on called a grid. And uh, as developers, you guys are actually probably pretty familiar with layout grids. That would not have been the case four or five years ago. This is responsive design has made us all start to think a lot more about grids. And so we have grid systems that are sort of built for CSS that we all use. Um, but it's old. The grids have been around for literally centuries. And the reason is that they work. It's a great way to force yourself to give structure to a document. Um, the, uh, the Bauhaus folks were famous lovers of the grid. And I think the reason is that it, um, you know, the Bauhaus movement was a lot about trying to, to take sort of like industrialized design, right? Like to create repeatable patterns for how you think about designing something. And the grid is one of those things that is highly repeatable. It works in so many situations. So this is this, I, this beautiful document. I, I actually don't remember who created it. 
but you can see this like super strong grid there. And I saw this and I loved it because this looks like something that we'd create for the web today, right? Like this kind of a grid is probably familiar. Um, you know, it looks like, I don't know, like the foundation grid or something like that. Like it looks like something that you've probably seen. And yet this was created, I think, in like the, the early 20th century. Um, this is how we use a grid today, and this is probably how you guys think about it. So we have all these, you know, lots of systems, and, and it's, it really is a fantastic way to think about uh, how to lay out a page and, and where to put type on a page. Um, a lot of times it's easy to feel like the grid is confining, and, um, and I, I can see that I think can be the case, but uh, great graphic artists have been using grids forever to give structure to something that is, ha, is fluid or to give st structure to something that appears to have no structure. And this Miles Davis album cover, I think, is a great example of a crazy grid. But look at how he's used that grid to not... Like, if you look at the, the picture of Miles Davis up at the top, it sort of culminates, like, sort of in the, the center point of that grid. You, he devotes his, sort of this column to the front of the trumpet and that column to the text. Um, there's that, like, beautiful repeating pattern that that defines other kind of points of intersection within the, um, within the album cover. So don't feel uh, afraid to be creative in the way that you apply a grid. It's, it's a really great tool for you to um, keep structure and keep something that's organized, even if you're trying to push the limits of what you're doing with type. So um, if we apply a grid to Pixel Lab, um, then you can, well, let's see, do I have a picture? Yeah, so this is, I wish I didn't have the grid in between because I'd, I'd love for you to just see the before and after. So this was layout that was all done just by eye, just by looking at things. Um, this is layout done by grid. And I don't know, you know, th these things I think are sort of subtle to, to see and it's, it's very much subjective about whether or not that looks better. But to my eye, we just added a ton of structure to this thing. I feel like all of a sudden it feels like it flows and it feels like it kind of works. Um, it also gives us a place for some navigation and we can make that fit within the grid and we continue to kind of keep the harmony that the grid's imposing on this. Um, also, uh, here's just a random graphic that we could put and I stuck the intersection of this very large graphic right at the intersection of two lines in the grid and, um, you, and use that to kind of balance out the menu that we have on the, other, uh, on, on the other side there. And then just to kind of finalize our contrast, we can play with color a little bit. Okay. Does anybody know what this number is? The golden ratio, yeah. Um, so this is, do you know this is a really controversial number? People love to talk about how great this number is. I honestly don't believe in it. Um, other than the fact that I believe it's a number, and I think that, uh, that for the thing we're about to talk about, you need a number, so we'll, we'll go with it. So the golden ratio has been around forever, and it uh, does create the basis for a ton of design. It shows up in the works of Salvador Dali in this particular uh, printing of Paradise Lost. Um, uh, the, I think the pyramids have some golden ratio. Basically, the way the golden ratio works, the idea is that um, in this case, uh, the, as you subdivide something, you'll con the, 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 the two ratios will continue to sort of preserve themselves as you get smaller and smaller and smaller as you continue to subdivide. And that number works out to be 1.618. So the question is, does it actually work? And like I said, that is very controversial. But the thing that it does do, like I said, is it gives us a number. And um, there's a thing that you need to do as a typographer, which is you need to choose the sizes for your text. And size is kind of important because as we saw, if the sizing is off, we're not creating enough contrast uh, to actually convey differences between the different types of text. So um, there's this thing that typographers use called a modular scale. And this is a great place to start. If you ever find yourself needing to lay out some text, this is a fantastic place to start. Um, this guy, Robert Bringhurst, is sort of like the, the modern sort of master of typographic design. This is another great book, um, not maybe targeted as the, at developers in the same way as the Alex White book, but it is kind of the manual for modern type design. And he, I don't know if he introduced the idea of a modular scale or just popularized it, but he talks about this idea of a modular scale as being a prearranged set of harmonious proportions. So like I said, you need a number and it could be the golden ratio. Um, people use other uh, ratios for that too. And there's this great website that you can go to called it's modularscale.com and it will help you define a modular scale. And basically what you do is you 
come up with a base, and you can add more than one, but so I chose 24 pixels in this case. Um, and normally, like, if you're doing web design, you would set that as sort of the body size, and then you can use um, ratios from there to define the other sizes that you need to work with, so your different headings and, and whatnot. Um, and so here's the thing. Because you need a number um, to do that, uh, he lets you choose, and there's a lot of people that sort of, I guess, would... Uh, I, I don't know, sort of evangelize this idea that you should pull from um, the sort of musical scale. So he lets you choose musical scale. So in this case, you can see that we're, we're using a minor second. Um, and I'm, I wanted to do, yeah, well, actually, we'll do it really quick. I wanted to do something kind of interesting. So um, I'm going to play a minor second, and you tell me if you think that that type looks like a minor second. Okay, so this is a minor second. So do you see it? I don't know if I see it. Um, but it's kind of interesting. Okay, so here's another one. This is a perfect fourth. I'll play a perfect fourth for you. So this is a fourth. Um, Stand a correlation. We can do the next one. This is a fifth. I don't know. So this this will be the uh, this will be the real test though. We'll go to uh, this is a, so now we're going to do a minor again. We'll do a mi this is a minor sixth. I don't know if I see it, but a lot of people swear by it. Um, but the idea is that, you know, we're naturally sort of aware of at least musical harmonies. So that I idea is if you're trying to harmonize the text on a page, you can use these sort of same musical harmonies to produce the harmony between the different sizes that you choose. And you can use these harmonies, you can use these ratios to define your grid. You can also use them to define the various uh, text sizes that you work with. This is, by the way, you have to choose these numbers, right? And so you might as well use this trick. And this is a fantastic website for it. Uh, so if you go to modularscale.com. I'd say in the, like, the past four or five years, this has become a really big thing. He, this guy, um, Tim Brown, who created the site, first started talking about this at a, a talk, I think, in 2010. And everybody was super excited about it. I don't think anybody had ever really thought about applying it to web design in that way. And um, since then, it's kind of everywhere. So, like, there's plugins that are built for this, for, like, Sketch and, and Illustrator, and it kind of shows up everywhere. Um, so if you look for modular scales now, you'll know uh, what that refers to. Oh, this is... I was going to ask you if this was felt sad. This is also a minor sixth. Does it feel sadder when we add the uh, sad dog to it? Kind of. Um, okay. So... Um, this is, so back to the kind of this pixel ad page that we're trying to design. So um, this is what we had before, and this was where we had just laid it all out by eye. And this is once we apply a, I think this is a perfect fifth to it. And to be honest with you, I have to say it felt a little bit better to me. It felt more organized. Um, it also uh, took on sort of a brighter, I don't know, tell me if you agree. I felt like it took on kind of a brighter, cheerier disposition. Maybe I'm making that up. But if that harmony is a real thing, I kind of felt it here. Um, so it does kind of feel sunnier. And, and that is a perfect fifth, the sunniest of all uh, harmonies. Okay, so that's layout. Do you guys feel like uh, typography layout experts? If you do, we will move on to technology in the remaining seven minutes. Oh, are we supposed to be done right now? Or do we? Okay, we've got seven more minutes. Okay, so we've got seven more minutes. Um, do you guys know what these two numbers are? Does anybody know? What is it? Sorry, I didn't hear you. I, pixels per inch, you're right. So what makes these two interesting? So 72 is significant for two reasons. It is the number of points in an inch in traditional print typography, right? So if you have an eight-point font, that means it's a ninth of an inch, or a nine-point font would be an eighth of an inch. It's also the, um, sort of the implied DPI uh, of a Mac. So if you say that something is... Um, uh, 72 pixels high. In theory, that would be approximately um, one inch high on a screen, on a Mac. 96, for whatever reason, Microsoft chose to, uh, to, to be 96 DPI on their screens. Um, the reason that I brought this up, actually, it's, you, you really don't need to know this. To be honest, it doesn't matter anymore. But there was a time when it did. It doesn't really matter. But the reason I bring it up is just to show just how crazy the world of type rendering is and the, the kind of minutia that it carries with it. Somebody had to make this decision, like what is an eight-point font on screen? And those decisions were made a very, very long time ago and really did not account for the way that things work today. 
This was the history that they were inheriting. We've gone from a printing press to an offset press to a digital press, where, you know, a digital press today has, it probably prints at 2,400 DPI. Um, a digital display in 1970 was about 70 DPI if you were lucky. Actually, much smaller than that. It, that 70 DPI would have been like 1980s. Um, in the 1970s, probably would have been much smaller than that. So it was a huge, you know, sort of step away from what we were used to working with. And even today, this is something we kind of have to deal with. So this is from uh, the online version of the New Yorker, and you can see the huge difference that we have between the, the quality of rendering that you would get with something like a, you know, like a, I guess an offset press where you literally are confined, I guess, by the molecular properties of the ink to, you know, being confined to 72 pixels in an inch or whatever. Um, so there's a lot of complication to rendering, and uh, I like to think about it as sort of these, it, these three things, and uh, we'll think about it as a cake, because they stack on top of one another. Um, first is typeface design, and we're just going to cruise through these, because we only have five minutes. Um, typeface design highly influences the way the type gets perceived on a screen. And um, the... As we talked about, a lot of the typefaces that we love even today were, were not designed for screens. They were designed for print. Futura and Times New Roman are great examples of that, but even something like Helvetica, which is, shows up everywhere, um, was designed in the 1950s, well before anybody was thinking about how that would look on a screen. Today, we can actually design typefaces that are great for screens, and we can even create versions of classic typefaces that are better for screens. Um, this typeface is, is the one that I mentioned down there. In, in 2005, um, the JAF created a version of a typeface that I think was originally for print that they called Facet Web. And they created a web-specific version of this typeface. And this is what they said that they did in order to make it better for, um, for the web or for rendering on a screen. They increased the X height. Remember we talked about that for readability. They shortened the descenders. So again, they kind of pulled things. A descender is like the bottom of a G. It's the things that go down below the baseline. And so they pulled those up. Um, they created a lighter version of bold because what tends to happen is bold fonts tend to render too bold on screen and uh, regular or lighter fonts tend to render um, too light. So they, they created a bold version that was lighter. And then um, they manually hinted, and we'll talk about what that means, the, the typeface. Um, so once you design a great typeface, you need to uh, get it to render well on the screen. And for that, we use fonts. So the digital equivalent of that bucket of type is a font. Now, the digital, it's a file. And inside of that file, it's kind of like a little mini program or, or information that tells you how to render that onto a screen. The original fonts were bitmaps. It's changed a lot. But originally, it was just a list of, it was just a bunch of characters, just a bunch of images. Um, and you would have... Chicago at 24 point, or the one that is crazy to me is San Francisco. Why? So Apple design, these are the Apple, the Mac fonts. I don't know why they made it look like a kidnap, like a ransom note, the one that they named after their hometown. Um, but anyway, so, the, uh, so you, would, you would get a typeface name or a font name and also the size because the size had to be pre-rendered. Um, the first laser printers prompted Adobe to create something called PostScript. And PostScript was, at the time, a landmark, because instead of having the like little images for each of the characters, now you had a little program, a little bit of code that would execute and tell you how to render a character in a particular spot. And that was a big deal. They needed it because um, laser printers, Apple launched their first like home laser printer, but even prior to that there were commercial laser printers. Um, and they needed that because they had a much higher resolution than uh, screens did, and so we needed digital type that could match the resolution of those printers. In 1991, um, Apple and Microsoft got sick of needing to pay licensing fees for PostScript, so they came up with their own uh, format. They called it TrueType. And TrueType introduced something really cool, which is what we just talked about, which is hinting. So TrueType was also different in that it was screen first instead of print first. And so they introduced a solution to this weird problem, which is what do you do when uh, the the way that you're telling the letters to draw don't fall along pixel boundaries. And so in that little program that knows how to draw a letter M or a letter A or whatever, now there's information that says scoot over a little bit if you're right on a pixel boundary. Um, so you get something that looks a lot more like this. You get the, the bottom instead of the top. 
Um, I used to think that hinting looked like this, like you just scoot things over. It looks a lot more like this. It's crazy. The world of hinting is kind of uh, nuts. And uh, fortunately, today we can automate a lot of it, though. If you ever want to try to design a typeface, um, a lot of this can actually get, uh, get done for you. 1996, we combined TrueType and PostScript and created the best of TrueType and best of PostScript and created something called um, OpenType. And OpenType uh, made typography even richer, um, gave us the ability to have interesting character combinations. Um, we'll kind of cruise through that. In 2010, this is where we are today. We came up with a new typeface, or sorry, a new format called WAF. WAF looks like this. It's basically a... Um, way to encapsulate open type and compress it and then include a little bit of licensing information and so that you can deploy it on the web. So when you see a WAF, if you work on the web, if you do a lot of web work, this is universally supported in every modern version of every browser. This is definitely the format that you want to use. Um, for a while, you, the, there were certain browsers that couldn't render this. Today, you don't need to worry about it. I, I think, uh, yeah, I, honestly, I, we just deploy WAF today. We don't even do true type or SVG anymore. Um, and so this is what you should use, except you should use this instead. So now there's WAF 2. The thing that got better is it compresses slightly better. And it's, uh, it's worth it. You know, some typefaces can get really, really big. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about rasterization, except I'm going to tell you this one very exciting thing, which is look at this. Look at what happened between 2005 and, uh, frankly, between 2009 and 2010. We got a huge uh, display resolution boost. And the reason that we can cruise through the rest of this is, to be honest with you, at that kind of DPI, a lot of the tricks that we normally would need to use in order to make type look better just aren't necessary. Um, we have, you know, very high resolution. That said, we still, I mean, you know, a lot of us are still using, like, like regular resolution LCDs. So we still need to think about it. Um, I'm going to cruise through this. It's, uh, if you get a chance, it's interesting to kind of read about the different rendering technologies um, that we can use. Um, where I wanted to end was uh, that I'm not sad, but I would have been if it wasn't for this, so now I'm happy. And um, to tell you this, the future of type is bright. Even if you are just a hobbyist, no matter what you do, I think understanding a little bit about typography and its rich history is uh, exciting, and it's an exciting time to be paying attention to type. Um, some things I'm excited about are the increased pixel densities that we have on our devices and screens today. Um, icon fonts, if you guys are web developers, I'm sure you know what that is, but it's a really great way to deploy vectors on the web um, and to you know, work with iconography on the web. And um, open source type, and here's a, basically there's this incredible thing happening right now where there is a huge amount of open source and because of that you know, free for many uses uh, fonts and typography on the web. And these are some great sources. I'm sure you guys know about Google Fonts. Here are a couple of others. Um, uh, and this, to me, is an invitation for anybody who has any interest in typography at all to jump in, because there is a lot of quality typography that is available for you to play with for free. So go make a poster. Go make a website. Go do something with your kids. And feel free to experiment with typography and, and put yourself into it. You know, there's a lot of developers in this room. Typography is the perfect, in my mind, intersection of sort of the creative arts and, um, and the sciences, and it is a great place for uh, developers to do something fun and sort of express your most creative side. So I leave that with you with a big thank you and for your time. So thanks so much.